Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for joining us today to learn about treating and dealing with heartburn. I'm Brian Steinberg, Medical Director of Thoracic Oncology and Chairman of the Robotics Committee uh, here at Holy Cross Health. I'll be moderating today's session. Joining me today is Holy Cross Health gastroenterologist, Dr. Halim Charbel. Thank you. I am uh, Halim Charbel. I'm a gastroenterologist uh, at uh, Holy Cross, and uh, we'll try to answer all your uh, heartburn and other digestive health questions today. Before we begin answering your questions, I'd like to first call your attention to a few ground rules that you'll see in the comments section. Number one, we encourage you to participate, but please keep any questions and comments general. We won't be discussing anyone's specific health situation in this public forum. Number two, this education is not meant to replace professional medical advice or service. Personal health problems should be brought to the attention of the appropriate health professionals you deal with. And number three, these resources are provided to assist you and not to endorse any particular entity, service, or event. We're trying to educate you. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, we can connect with you one-on-one -on -one through our Digestive Health Program channels by phone or website. Remember, any comments you make here are public and visible to others watching. Now, on to your questions. What is heartburn? Dr. Charbel, All right. you want to hit so, that one? Yes, absolutely. So heartburn is a symptom, uh, and it is when somebody feels that there's a burning sensation in their chest, uh, and that usually is a result of acid reflux. So when acid that is normally produced in the stomach and that helps with digestion flows back to the esophagus, it can cause this burning sensation, which is heartburn. And the heartburn needs to be differentiated from the simple symptom versus what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease that has more of a pathological component to it. Because everybody can have some symptoms of heartburn from time to time, but when it is something that occurs <coughs> often and or can cause problems with the esophagus, then it becomes the disease. And we're going to talk a lot more about it during the discussion. Can you just briefly explain what causes heartburn? So there are different causes of heartburn, mainly, as we said, the acid flowing back from the stomach upwards toward the esophagus. Uh, and that is something that can happen when the sphincter muscle, which is the muscle that is keeping the junction between the stomach and the esophagus tight. Uh, so we want the muscle to allow things to go down to the stomach, but we want to keep them from coming back up. But at the same time, sometimes as everybody has to release some some air from the stomach has to have some burping sometimes, uh, the muscle relaxes. And in certain cases, the muscle relaxes more than usual or more than normal. It allows acid to come up. And that's mainly the main mechanism of heartburn. However, uh, sometimes there are other causes of heartburn, whether it is an anatomical problem where there's a hiatal hernia, which you will explain more, or whether there's a problem with the stomach where the stomach is not functioning well, is not emptying well, so it predisposes the person to have more reflux toward the esophagus. These are the main causes of the symptom, the heartburn. Another question we had was, um, is heartburn related to heart problems? Since I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon, I will take that Go one. What's interesting is that the nerves that control the diaphragm, the phrenic nerves, uh, run alongside the heart. And the pain that comes from the area of the hiatus or where the esophagus transitions into the abdomen is innervated by those same nerves. So when pain is uh, felt from that spot, your brain can't really distinguish whether it's coming from your heart if you're having a heart attack or if it's coming from your esophagus. And uh, because of that, when people are having heartburn, it can create a lot of confusion. And while we may want to just hope that it's not a heart attack, uh, we need to make sure of that. And so uh, if people are having recurrent symptoms uh, in that area, whether it's pain here in the center of the chest or pressure, um, since your brain can't make that distinction, uh, we will always have you see a cardiologist as well to make sure that it's not a heart problem. And I think that leads into this next question, which is why do I have chest pain with Bar Barrett's disease? 
And, and that's basically the same issue. It's the same area is being uh, stimulated and causing the same pain, whether it's related to your heart or related to the esophagus. And so we always have to hand in hand make sure that that's not the case. And it's not uncommon that we'll have patients referred to both of us uh, from a cardiologist because someone thought they were having heart problems and went to see them and everything checked out okay with respect to their heart, but it wound up being um, a, a, a reflux issue. So I, don't want, I do want to make a comment because the question combined both uh, the symptom of chest pain and Barrett's uh, esophagus. And I want to make sure that people don't get confused. So people can have chest pain, as you said, as a symptom from acid reflux. But Barrett's esophagus is damage that can happen to the esophagus from the acid reflux. And that can predispose people to having esophageal cancer. So in some cases, rare cases of acid reflux, Barrett's esophagus can happen and can predispose to esophageal cancer. But Barrett's esophagus itself uh, does not cause symptoms, does not cause chest pain. So I just wanted to make sure that is clear. Um, the next question is, I have a lot of pain in the mouth of my stomach, like it's burning, and I feel it on my right side. Um, so I think that's the, 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 same, the same question. Uh, uh, the person asking it clarified that they do not have stomach ulcers or esophageal ulcers, but they do have some stabbing chest pain. And they're asking, is it caused by inflamed nerves in, uh, in the esophagus? So there are a couple of different things. Uh, there is uh, pain that can occur in the throat or symptoms that are related more to the throat and the mouth from acid reflux because the acid can actually come all the way up to the mouth and people experience regurgitation sometimes at night and they wake up with fluid coming up all the way to their to their mouth so yes that can be irritation of the voice box sometimes or the or the mouth or the throat from the acid reflux yeah i was going to say that you know this is actually uh a uh an entity known as uh laryngopharyngeal reflux where people are complaining uh, predominantly of throat pain or hoarse voice uh, because they're waking up uh, with acid in the back of their throat. The, the reflux has been so extensive, it's not just staying down uh, in the lower esophagus, it's going all the way back up. And for some older patients, it can be a particularly acute problem because they may uh, inhale the acid which then can damage the lungs and actually cause pneumonias, which is not uncommon in people who had strokes and may not be swallowing normally. Mm -hmm. uh, but also if they're getting uh, reflux, it can be a serious problem. And it's not uncommon that um, uh, it, there are people who are experiencing asthma or asthma-like symptoms, and it's really related to reflux. So uh, you don't necessarily have to feel just uh, pain here in the center of your chest or chest pain, you can be manifesting other types of symptoms. Uh, and uh, so this one common problem of reflux can lead to many other associated issues. And we do have another question here, I think that goes along the same, the same line. And the, the person is asking that they have a raspy cough during the day and in the evening, although they do take medications and they don't uh, eat anything late in the evening. Uh, and these are good things to do. So sometimes people have acid reflux that occurs at night and when you lay flat and you have symptoms and cough at night and uh, not eating shortly before you go to bed, you lay flat is very helpful. So we will go into some lifestyle recommendations, but also that brings up uh, another factor uh, that I see often when people have reflux at night or regurgitations that go all the way up. Uh, many people have an abnormality that we call a hiatal hernia, and that makes it easier for reflux to happen when you're asleep. And I'm just going to leave it up to you to explain that probably a little bit more for the, for the patients because that's uh, something that's sure. a specialty. You know, the, the issue of how the lower esophageal sphincter works uh, is actually a fascinating uh, subject. Um, your food goes from your mouth to your stomach and uh, through the esophagus, and it transitions from the chest to the abdomen uh, through mm. a hole called the hiatus. 
Um, and for lack of a better explanation, I can, with my hands, demonstrate, as I look here at the camera, um, the crura or the anchoring points of the diaphragms, your left and right diaphragm, cross each other, creating a portal. And your esophagus and aorta actually go through that. And that's what goes from your chest and allows it to go from your chest into your abdomen. What happens over time, just from eating too much or having, if you're a, uh, a woman and you've had children, having had the uh, increased pressure of uh, a baby in the uterus pushing up, uh, and as you get older, what happens is these muscle fibers start splaying out and, and um, becoming wider and wider. And so just like someone can get a hernia in their groin, uh, which is not uncommon, they can get a hernia through the hiatus. And these can get quite large. Um, they start off small, uh, and then they can become quite large, uh, basically getting to four to five, even six inches in size. And that then allows the stomach and even the colon, sometimes the spleen, all of these structures in the abdomen to go up into the chest behind the heart. And that can cause actually a lot of problems because it can make people feel short of breath when they're exercising just because all of this mass of, um, of organs is pressing on the lungs and not letting them inflate. It can press on the back of the heart. And that can be a reason why someone starts having atrial fibrillation, also getting short of breath when exercising. And it can be a cause of pain. But the other thing that happens is the diaphragm, by having the length of the diaphragm next to the esophagus, stabilizes uh, the lower esophageal sphincter and sort of a scaffolding outside of the esophagus that helps shut the door, basically, uh, after food goes into the stomach so that acid doesn't reflux or go back into the esophagus. If basically the diaphragm opens up like this, they don't, you don't have that external support, you don't have that scaffolding, and basically the door is left wide open, and then, you know, food will go down, but then stuff will come back up into the esophagus, and that's, that's what we typically see happen. So when we surgically deal with this, we do two things. One is to fix the hole in the diaphragm and to tighten that up so that then there's extra support on the esophagus. And the other thing is to do something called an anti-reflux procedure. And there are several different types of procedures we do. Uh, and now there are some new devices that we use to prevent, you know, um, food material and acid going back up into the esophagus. So I hope that that gives some idea of what's going on. Um, uh, but it's something that uh, needs to be investigated because uh, these can be serious problems. And the other major problem, I and mean, we recently just operated on uh, someone for this, their stomach was, the entire stomach was up in the chest and had twisted. And that was a surgical emergency because the stomach can die uh, because the blood supply gets compromised. So just saying I have a hiatal hernia can sometimes not be the end of the story it sets people up to have very um, um, hazardous situations develop. And that's why it's a good idea to get these things uh, dealt with sooner rather than later in the middle of an emergency. All right. I think we are starting to get some questions about uh, treatment of, uh, of the heartburn or how to control it. So somebody's asking about how to stop having heartburn without surgery. So... I think we're going to address the treatment a little bit. There are surgical options and there are non-surgical options. To answer the question, uh, when, when heartburn occurs or when somebody is having uh, acid reflux, uh, we can have a couple of different approaches. One approach is uh, medications because we do have medications that are pretty effective in blocking the acid. So we have a couple of different classes of medications that block the, the cells in the stomach that make the acid. So we decrease the acid in the stomach and that naturally decreases the symptoms because we have less acid coming up to the esophagus. It does not stop the physical process of fluid coming up to the esophagus, but it's not acidic anymore. So it doesn't cause as many symptoms. So that's one option we have. And we have many people, millions of people who are taking these medications. 
And some of these medications can cause problems long-term or they may be appropriate for some patients or not. I know there's a lot of uh, talk and there are a lot of questions that we get about that. Uh, obviously, we never want to put anybody on a medication for years long-term unless they absolutely need it. Uh, but we also don't want anybody to be suffering with symptoms for years without taking medications that can be beneficial, that can help. So that's one part of the equation, the, the medication. But there are also other non-surgical options which are important, like lifestyle changes and, and diet. So we, we get asked all the time, and we had some people hint about it. Uh, so some lifestyle changes that we always recommend, one, if you have reflux at night, uh, don't eat and go to bed stay upright basically for up to three hours if possible after eating before laying flat. If you go to bed, it always helps uh, if you can elevate the head of the bed uh, so you have an incline under your chest so you don't have, you have basically uh, gravity working in your favor and pulling the fluid down. Uh, also, yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think that um, using medications early on can be um, uh, very helpful. Um, but there may come a point where uh, the dosage has to be increased. Um, and then as you're suggesting, people are finding that they need to basically sleep in a chair uh, to prevent uh, uh, symptoms, even being on medication. It suggests that there's a progression of the disease. And there may be something like a hiatal hernia Absolutely. Or there may be, uh, and basically 50% of people with a hiatal hernia have reflux. So just having the hiatal hernia, again, because of the loss of that external support uh, can, uh, can allow reflux to occur. Um, you start getting to the point where surgery is necessary. And as a surgeon, you know, I don't think that, uh, and now with all the minimally invasive surgical techniques we have, that while... You know, there's, there are risks to surgery and there are hazards to surgery. Uh, there are also tremendous benefits. So if uh, our medical options are being outpaced by the problem, um, uh, surgery should not be something that prevents someone from considering it uh, because they're afraid. Uh, but it really requires understanding what the problem is and understanding Absolutely. the physiology and then having a uh, targeted solution for that problem. I think we definitely all agree that there is no one solution that fits all, and, and, and we don't want to imply that surgery or the minimally invasive procedures that can be done are a last resort after somebody has been suffering for 20 years. Uh, it's an option, and actually most of the patients that we end up referring for these procedures are patients who are able to control their symptoms with medications, but they come to me and they say, I don't want to be taking these medications long term, whether because they're concerned about potential side effects or whether because they, it's inconvenient. Uh, so it's an option. It's important to think of options patients have rather than just one step at a time and surgery as last resort. Uh, you know, I think this is a good opportunity to uh, delve slightly into uh, the fact that making a diagnosis of what the problem is is very important. And maybe we can just talk a little bit about the different diagnostic tools mm -hmm. that we use. Uh, unfortunately, I think for patients, and also fortunately for patients, they have access to buying antacids and PPIs over the counter. So a lot of people start doing that on their own. But the, the problem is that then they're not being uh, properly diagnosed. They're treating a symptom but not necessarily the, um, uh, the cause of the problem. So, so why don't you tell us what you do uh, when someone has been on a PPI for either months yeah. or years that they've been taking themselves, and now it's getting worse? Sure. How do you figure out what's going on? So first, it is, it is a good thing, I think, that people have access to, to, to medications and when they have some symptoms because it's such a widespread problem. So many people have it that sometimes they have some occasional symptoms and they can treat it uh, on their own. Having said that, when the problem is ongoing, 
when symptoms don't just disappear after you take a medicine for a couple of weeks, we certainly want to make sure that there's nothing, nothing more serious going on. And as I mentioned before, there are two different forms of, uh, of acid reflux. The benign form that most people have that is not causing actual damage, but there are other forms that can cause damage. So we do have multiple tests, as you mentioned, to diagnose the problem. So there are one uh, test that check for the actual acid to determine whether this person is actually having acid reflux causing the symptoms. And that's the broader or pH test. Yes. Maybe so, you could just explain what that is. So we, we can do an endoscopy, basically when the patient is put to sleep and uh, we go in from the mouth down to the esophagus and the stomach with a camera and we can introduce a capsule that we put, we kind of stick it to the wall of the esophagus and that wire detects the acidity of the esophagus and it stays there for three or five days and it transmits this data wirelessly to a receiver that the patient carries on their belt and they can you know, push a button and mark if they had an episode of heartburn or other symptoms and eventually we can read this data and correlate it and know is this patient having just hypersensitivity of the esophagus or are they having acid reflux? Is their reflux correlating with their cough or whatever symptom they're having or not? So that's a big uh, component of the testing. What happens to that thing that you've clipped to the esophagus? Yes, so we introduce it to the esophagus and it's just, it, it sticks to the superficial lining of the esophagus. So it stays a few days and then after a few days it just falls off and it goes through the digestive tract and comes out in the stools and people don't even notice that it, uh, it came out. So it's, that's so, a tiny so it's not like they're, you know, permanent. No, absolutely okay. not. Um, we do have other testing. And yeah, and, and I think the other thing is important is that you do a uh, endoscopy. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could just explain what that is. Yes. So uh, as we mentioned uh, about making sure that there is no damage to the esophagus uh, or evaluating, diagnosing whether the problem is anatomical, such as a hiatal hernia. Uh, when patients have been having acid reflux for a while and is persistent, we do recommend an endoscopy, meaning the patient comes to the hospital or to the endoscopy center, we give them medication, they fall asleep, and we go in, take a look, and we look in the esophagus and see, is there a hiatal hernia? Is there any damage? Take some biopsies, assess for inflammation and come out. And that's a procedure that takes probably around five to 10 minutes. And then they wake up and they, we watch them a little bit in the recovery area and they go home. So it's an outpatient procedure. It's a very simple procedure, but it allows us to diagnose the problem, assess the damage, and assess the potential for intervention, such as fixing a hiatal hernia if there's a big hiatal hernia or that's the problem. One of the things that you see is, are there ulcerations, mm -hmm. which is for an effect of the chronic um, exposure to acid? Yes. Uh, you know, someone was asking about ulcers and pain um, and it's basically, if you can just imagine if you have a cut on your hand or you have uh, a scab that you've peeled off and then you pour alcohol on it, that that causes a lot of pain. Uh, and that's really what's happening with this chronic exposure to acid that has eaten away because it's not just acid, it's bile uh, mm -hmm. salts as well from the gallbladder. That stuff gets into the stomach, washes back in, and it can go up into the esophagus. And, um, and there are digestive enzymes in that. And so you, you're basically eating yourself away. Um, and that can, that's why people with ulcerations are feeling pain. It's a similar mechanism as the ulcers that people have in their stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and one I, of the, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to mention that uh, this is one of the situations where medications are very beneficial. If we go in and we see somebody has esophagitis, inflammation, and ulcers in the esophagus, we absolutely need to put them on high dose of these medications to heal the esophagus and prevent long-term long -term problems. And then we can discuss other options. And if they see that erosive esophagitis, that basically proves that they're having absolutely. reflux. They don't need absolutely. to do that other test. Yes. Okay. Um, one of the other things that I think we're very fortunate about is we actually have very good imaging mm -hmm. studies that can be done. Uh, one such study is an esophagram, which I like to order. Yes. Um, do you want to just briefly discuss what? Yes. So what sometimes you see we need to that? evaluate the anatomy of uh, of the esophagus, and we can do X-rays uh, with giving the patient 
uh, liquid that's a contrast to drink. They drink it and then we get x-rays of the esophagus to see how the esophagus looks like, evaluate the anatomy, is there anything abnormal like a hiatal hernia, sometimes we see the reflux or sometimes there's a diverticulum, something like right. that that needs to be addressed. That's like a little outpouching uh, of the esophagus. Uh, some people have something called a Zenker's diverticulum. Uh, there can be epiphrenic or near the diaphragm diverticulum and uh, and, and these can cause problems or abnormalities with swallowing. And uh, I like to actually get the uh, esophagrams done under fluoroscopy. So you can actually make a movie of uh, the contrast going down the esophagus. And it gives you some sense of the mechanics yeah. of the esophagus, which I think then leads us to the next issue, which I'm actually very excited about. At Holy Cross Germantown, we've just gotten a high resolution manometry uh, device that allows us to um, do a test and it's now I think the only uh, place in the area uh, that allows us to um, uh, measure the pressure wave of the es esophagus squeezing uh, liquids uh, down into the stomach and that way we can assess uh, is there uh, an issue with the squeezing ability of the esophagus? Uh, because there are some people who have very flaccid esoph uh, esophaguses. Some people have very hypercontractile esophaguses. Some people have something called achalasia, where there's an obstruction, or they have um, uh, Shatsky's rings uh, that need to be dilated. Uh, so not only can we look down the esophagus and see what's going on down there. Not only can we get special images and pictures, but now we can actually measure the squeezing ability of the esophagus. And putting all this data together, then let's just say, what is the real problem? So that then if we are gonna consider surgery or something endoscopically being done, that we can actually uh, make sure that it's the right thing for the right problem. Because what we don't want is to do a great operation for the wrong problem, then somebody either can't swallow Absolutely. food, which would be horrible, or they they can't uh, uh, burp, uh, and they get then full of uh, yeah. gas. And, you know, uh, uh, so these are very important considerations. And we're actually doing all of that uh, in a package of uh, evaluations uh, to make sure that people are getting the right treatment for the right problem. I do have, before we end, a few questions about treatment that I want to make sure we address. Uh, and particularly, I have people asking about the magnetic device that can be used to actually control the situation in a minimally invasive way. So maybe you can explain a little bit about, about the LINCS procedure and uh, give the patients some idea about it. Okay, we used to... Um, do something called the Nissen fundoplication, where we would wrap the stomach around the esophagus uh, to basically give it that structural support around the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Great operation, very effective at preventing reflux. The problem was people couldn't burp or vomit. And so that was causing a lot of retching, bloating, and discomfort. So we were training one problem for another and, uh, and this was not a very uh, satisfactory uh, situation. Uh, there's now been, a, 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 I don't even want to call it a new device because it's been out for many years and there, uh, you know, over 50,000 people have had these devices implanted. Um, and basically it's a magnetic beaded bracelet uh, that goes around the lower esophageal sphincter. So when someone swallows, uh, the bolus of food, the esophagus generates a pressure in excess of 15 millimeters of mercury pressure to squeeze the food down into the stomach. That causes the magnets to pop open and the food passes into the stomach normally. Uh, then after the food bolus goes into the stomach, it contracts again and that closes the door basically or... or or gives the external support to the lower esophageal sphincter so you don't get acid refluxing into the esophagus. If someone drinks a lot of soda pop or beer or you know has gas for whatever reason, if the pressure in the stomach exceeds 15 millimeters of mercury, the beads pop open and the gas pops up. 
and um, and then it closes immediately again. The same thing, someone gets the flu and they have to vomit, the pressure goes up, it, um, uh, the bracelet opens and, uh, uh, and you're able to expel whatever is causing the, the, uh, the nausea and you're able to vomit. And no one likes to do that, but imagine you have to vomit and you can't. I mean, that's really a problem. A problem. Um, the other important thing to know about the device is that it's safe in an MRI. Um, the uh, magnets of an MRI don't attract the uh, metal in the device because it's made out of something called nitinol, which is inert to magnetic uh, fields. Um, the only thing that can happen in a very powerful MRI, greater than three Tesla, is that the magnets can become deactivated. And, um, you know, so people need to know that they can get an MRI, but not greater than 1.5 Tesla. And that's basically uh, the situation with that. Um, I think after uh, Dr. Steinberg taking this to a very high tech level, I'm just going to bring it back down to some basic low tech. And we have some questions about diet that I wanted to, to make sure we address as well. So is, does pepperoni pizza cause heartburn? Not at all. Go for okay. it. Uh, so the first thing that we tell patients is that you need to avoid fatty foods such as a pepperoni pizza, because fatty foods take much longer to digest. They stay in the stomach longer, and they, so there's a more content in the stomach and more potential for acid reflux. Uh, there are certain foods that are known to cause more heartburn than others, uh, such as caffeinated beverages. So anything with caffeine can increase this relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Carbonated beverages are also something we recommend avoiding when you're having uh, these symptoms. And anything that has peppermint in it is also sometimes considered uh, a factor in causing more, more symptoms. So these are like some basic diet stuff that we can recommend for people to avoid. And, uh, but it's important for everybody to take away the notion that this is something that's so frequent and, and you can have options and you can take some medications, but you can do certain things on your own losing weight and exercising are very, very important because they help with these, uh, with these symptoms. But sometimes it's a bigger problem. We can evaluate it. We have the ways to evaluate it. And we have multiple treatment options from the basics to the super high stuff, high tech stuff that you do. Well, we're out of time and I want to thank you for uh, joining us. It's, uh, I think we've enjoyed it quite a bit. Good. Um, so thank you for tuning in today. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we're planning to provide additional information through our Holy Cross Health blog, and we can connect with you one-on-one -on -one through our Digestive Health program channels via phone or the website. Have a great day.